One of the more popular books in the construction industry in recent years is Extreme Ownership by Jocko Wilnick and Leif Babin. And the reason why is because the principles described there by the former Naval SEAL commanders apply very closely to the challenges that are experienced in construction on a daily basis. And it's interesting, if you've read the book, you know that um, a lot of the action, so to speak, takes place in um, Ramadi around 2006. And you may be wondering, what was it like for the folks who were on the ground, who Jocko and Leif were leading? And today on Construction Genius, you're going to find out because one of my two guests is Jeremy Beal. He is the co-founder and chief leadership officer of Radix Services. And we're joined by him and Peter Warhunsky, the co-founder and president of Radix Services. And Peter and Jeremy, along with Erica Beal, have recently launched Radix Services, which is a large-scale civil utility infrastructure construction contractor. And Jeremy is bringing his over 20 years of experience in the SEAL teams to the construction industry now. And he has recently retired after 23 years of faithful and dedicated naval service. We spend a lot of time in this podcast. This one's a little longer than my usual episode. We we go over 60 minutes, but I want you to hang in for the whole time because we we go through Jeremy's experience in the SEALs from his days in BUDS in 1999-2000 to his deployment to Iraq, then to Afghanistan, and then into more senior leadership roles in the teams. And we talk about how that experience has shaped the way that he thinks about leadership and then we have a wonderful back and forth discussion with Jeremy and Peter about how that then applies in the construction industry. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation, and I'd like you just to pay close attention. Um, this is actually Jeremy's first time on a podcast, and he brings a lot of experience and insight that I think you're going to find tremendously helpful. I'm really looking forward to seeing how Peter and Jeremy and Erica grow Radix services in the coming years. And I'm really grateful that they joined me today on Construction Genius. Feel free to share this episode with other people who you think would benefit from hearing it. And as always, thank you for listening to Construction Genius. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Jeremy, Peter, welcome to Construction Genius. Thanks for having us, Eric. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Peter, I think you are the only... Uh, the second three-time guest on, on Construction Genius. Great to have you back on the show. Oh, it's great to be here. And Jeremy, um, it's wonderful to have you on the program as well. I know you and Peter are collaborating in the construction industry and on a number of exciting initiatives. And you've recently retired uh, from a 20-year-plus career with the uh, the Navy SEALs. And I'd like you just to begin, Jeremy, by by taking us through your history in the SEALs and... As you're doing that, I, I want the audience to be considering how the experience that you have both in the field and in the the higher command levels relates to the construction industry. So, Jeremy, just introduce yourself, please, to the audience. Gladly. Thank you, Eric. Um, so I came, um, I joined the Navy in uh, 1999, right after I graduated high school um, from a small town uh, about an hour outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I knew I needed to, you know, expand my horizons a little bit. So uh, the military always had a, always held a real uh, appeal for me. Um, <clears throat> so it was always something I kept going back to where I was, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do after high school. Um, and it really kind of boils down to like, I just wanted to be part of an elite group of people that did elite stuff, you know, not, not the stuff right. that, you know, so uh, I would got kind of drawn towards, uh, towards Naval Special Warfare and becoming a, a SEAL, just hearing about, uh, who they were, what they did, what they went through, what it took to become one of them, and it held a lot of uh, a lot of appeal for me. 
Now, let me ask you, Jeremy, was that prior prior to join the Navy that you were thinking you intentionally joined the Navy because that was the route into the SEALs? Or was that as you had joined the Navy? No, I joined the Navy with the intention of uh, getting into naval special warfare. Um, I had okay. talked to all the service branches uh, before deciding on the Navy. Uh, I wanted to hear what they all had to say, explore my options. Um, and once I found out that um, there was a route to get into naval special warfare uh, rather quickly, um, uh, I was like, all right, sounds good. Sign me up. Let's go. Now, why, where, do, where do you think that, that thought of yours to be with an elite group of people doing elite stuff, where, where did that come from? Probably the simplest answer I can give you is uh, child of the 80s. I grew up watching G.I. Joe. And uh, <laughs> as, as strange as it sounds, like not, not that I you know, you know, wanted to uh, be a G.I. Joe, but uh, in the sense that I, I did because... Again, they were just an elite group of people that did elite stuff. They were doing the things that no one else wanted to do. And that's just something that always uh, just always kind of stuck with me. It was, it was really more than a cartoon. It was really just kind of like the, the teamwork and the camaraderie, just all, all the stuff that appeals to, to, to people. So I don't think um, – and I think I got about as close as I could get to becoming a G.I. Joe with, uh, with, with the group that I uh, ultimately got, came working with. Uh, I will say, though, I never saw an episode of uh, – G.I. Joe headquarters, you know, I never saw Duke, you know, given a, uh, a strategic budget planning brief for, you know, no one was doing ORM sheets, but uh, I guess that doesn't really sell. <laughs> they were, they were, uh, they were men of action as opposed to men of uh, planning. <laughs> yeah. I don't think G.I. Joe HQ would really get, uh, would, would warrant high ratings, but uh, yep. Yep. it was just kind of that, uh, that, that mentality of like, I just wanted to be part of so- something more than just the, the, the run of the mill. Yep. No, I understand. You joined the Navy and, and then you, you, you went to BUDS, what, in April 2000? I, I checked into BUDS training in April 2000 and uh, fortunately made it through. Uh, no, no, uh, no injuries, no, no roles in training. So uh, I graduated um, in uh, April of uh, 2001 and checked into uh, my, first, uh, my first command, uh, SEAL Team 3, out here in, uh, in Coronado, April 18th, 2001. Wow. Right before the, what, was the, uh, what was the biggest challenge for you in BUDS? I, I, to, honestly, probably just uh, just staying in the routine and just kind of learning to not over, overdo too much. Like just like okay, what, what what's the task? What's the objective? What do we got to get done? And just grind it until it does, to to get finished with uh, what with what you need to do. It's interesting though, because um you know I you know I've I've thought about it a, a bit and watched you know you know watched your YouTube videos on the buds training and all that kind of stuff and the the guys who succeed and the guys who fail and so you have these. I was hanging out with you a couple of weeks ago and I noticed some of the folks there who are at your retirement ceremony, you know, they're, they're just ordinary dudes. You know, a lot of them, you know, they're not like these yoked up, you know, six foot three jocks. I mean, some of them are like that, but a lot of them are just ordinary dudes. Some of them are kind of little and kind of, you know, they're not you know, like, oh, wow, that's definitely a Navy SEAL, you know. How, what, what, why is it that in, in, in the SEALs there is this um, – why do you think those guys who seem to be so strong and so outwardly, you know – impressive why why don't they always succeed with the seals do you think Ooh, there's honestly a, a, a ton of uh, reasons that have been you know uh, speculated upon and hypothesized around and uh, everything else and you know they've been studying navy seal training since s- since the beginning and like trying to come up with like you know better metrics of like you know to predict who's gonna be successful and who's not and they've they, they're while well, they're getting better at it they're they're still they're, they're still just as uh as, as wide of reasons as as you can come up with um a lot of the guys that are, again, this is just, you know, my observation, just both times Please, as, student, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, as, as an instructor, you know, a lot of times it seems like, you know, folks don't really know how to really deal with, with failure. A lot of those folks uh, that you're talking about, you know, the, the, the biggest, strongest, you know, always the fastest, they were always the, the high performers. They were always the captain of the team. They were always this, they were always that. And so now when they're in an environment where they may not be the best at something, or they have to work a little harder to, to, to do it. Like they just don't, they, they've never been met with that challenge before. Cause um, the, the, the cold is an amazing equalizer. Like there's, the, you can, there's no way to out tough the cold. You, like, and if you've never, if you're not used to that environment, if you're not used to that, or if you've never had to really dig down deep and gut through something, then that's, that's hard for some people to do. How, how did you dig down deep and gut through it? How did you do that yourself? I, I just knew that that was where I wanted to be. And there was really nothing else they could do uh, that, that was going to make me uh, change my mind on that. So it so, wasn't that uh, complicated then? 
Actually, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the uh, probably for, for me the biggest challenge and the biggest uh, the thing that held the most apprehension for me going through training, uh, knowing about it before even came in was um, was this fifty meter underwater swim that you had to accomplish. You had to jump in, do a somersault, and then you know, swim down the pool and back fifty meters underwater, holding your breath. And for some reason, like that was the thing that just just got me. You know, I was like, like th that was the one. And I knew that um, if I didn't pass it the first time I jumped in the pool, I would probably psychologically like just like. I probably would fail at any other temporary that, that that was my best time to probably get it done. So I was like, well, there's an instructor over top of me. I'm not going to drown. So let's just, just gut through and get it done. And so, and so doing that then as, as you were doing that, if you can recall, I know, I know it was many years ago. Was there ever a point where you thought in that 50 meter swim, there's just no way I can continue. And you, and you just pushed on through, or were you just like, just singularly focused and, and you just kept going and going. Singular focus on the objective. That was it. Yeah. We'll get and so if you're focused on the objective, that helps to kind of block out the noise and the physical discomfort and all those kinds of things. Is, is that what worked for you? I think so. Just something to just help you push past that, uh, that, that point. How, how long did it take you to realize that, you know, physically you're capable of doing way more than you think, than you, you know, we, we think mentally, you know, you know, you know how people talk about that all the time. We're actually capable of doing way more than, than um, we think we are. How long did it take you to reach that point of, of an understanding? I was confident I was going to pass buds and graduate about an hour into day one because I think with a lot of things the uh, the anticipation is always worse than the uh, than the actual uh, once you get on the ground start doing it you know we had our day one like PT I think it started at like five o'clock in the morning I can't remember but um, you know within the first hour we had about you know ten ten or so folks quit in the first hour in the first hour and like and, and more than a couple of those folks were the ones that you were talking about, like those guys that were like, you know, they could, you know, run like a deer and swim like a fish and just, and they were just strong. And they were just, I was like, Oh my God. And I started thinking, it's like, well, I guess they're not going to be here anymore. So I was like, I'm fine. I, I, I knew that. I was like, I'm going to be good. Interesting. What do you think is the difference between confidence? Cause I mean, like the first hour in, you're like, yeah, I'm good. We're, I'm going to make this. What's the difference between confidence and cockiness? Cockiness being the negative, you know, the arrogance. What's the difference between confidence and arrogance? How, how about that? Well, I think a lot of it is just like how much can you, are you making it about you? Or are you making it about the team? And, you know, are you really that, because um, you, you, I mean, you, you can have people that are, you know, quiet and cocky and you got other people that are, you know, just, you know, confident and quiet, you know, like there's really no one set, you know, way to do it. It's just really, are you, it's more about like, you know, if someone's really good and someone's a really, you know, high performer, are they, you know, talking talking bad about their other teammates so they just try are they really about them or are they you know really using their talents and and potential to help you know bring other people along so that's an interesting aspect there because you know on the one hand you know you're the one who's passing buds you're the one as an individual who's either going to to succeed or fail in, in the terms of going through the training and yet you also have to bring in that team element how much did that team element play um, a part in the motivation that you had as you went through the training it plays in a, a, a huge, uh, huge factor because one of the, um, you know, one of the things they really uh, hammer home in one of our, uh, you know, core tenets of you know how we you know do things and or the way we think things should be done. You know, it's first things is, you know, in order of precedence. You know, it's uh, you know the way you're taking care of stuff is like you know it's you know, country, team, teammate. You know, so it's you know, keeping mm -hmm. things in order. Like you know, like what's what's, you know, what's the ultimate objective? You know, like you know, it's serve the country and do what we do. The team first, your teammate. And then you, right. If you take care of people, you take care of your team, you take care of other people first and you worry about you last, you know, things kind of, you know, good things tend to happen even on a more, uh, even kind of more of a, on a micro level, you know, country team teammate, than going to, you know, you know, operationally, you're talking about, you know, you take care of team gear first, personal gear, and then yourself, hmm. you, you finish the op, you take care of, make sure that the, the boats are cleaned and flushed out and put away and got all the salt water off of them. You got all the all the guns and everything's taken care of and those have been cleaned and lubed and oiled and put away. Then you take care of your personal gear, make sure that all your equipment that you might need tomorrow or in a couple hours is back up and ready to go in, in case it needs to be done in case you got to go. And then finally you, then you get to take off the wet suit or you get to you know, change out of the wet clothes, get in the shower, get warmed up, get something to eat, take care of your, take care of your equipment, take care of your people. We're, then worry about you. And that's always been kind of one of the that that was beaten into my head very very early. Excellent. So take us through. You 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 got through buds. You're, you're 2001. We're before 9/11. 
And so, you know, you're, you're, you're before all that, that happens, give, give us a little more about your history as you were, you were involved in the teams. Yeah. So I, I got to the team there in April, um, went to a few, uh, professional, uh, schools along the way. And then, um, you know, we formed a Vezza platoon and right, right about then, right before we started work up and training in January of, uh, 2002, nine 11 happened. And that, um, that changed everything because, you know, uh, our, our kind of battle rhythm and deployment and the way we've been doing things has been kind of pretty set for the last, you know, 20 years, really since, uh, you know, desert or, you know, you know, Grenada and then things to the eighties and then nine and then uh, desert storm. So it's been pretty, it was pretty status quo up until that point. The nine 11 changed everything. So we mm-hmm. were, it was a really interesting time to, to be in and, and to be so young to see it go from, uh, an organization that had just been kind of like, you know, status quo to then to grow into the, the, the organization it's become in the last 20 years, but to see it go all the way from its, um, f- from the beginning of that to where it was, to where it was at its height and to where it is now, it was, it was incredible to, to, to witness. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so, th- so then as a result of that, you, you, how long was it until you deployed into, into the battle space um, that was related to, to the exactly. aftermath of 9-11? Us personally, we started our uh, workup and training for in January of O two, and we deployed in October, two thousand two. We were over there in the, in the Middle East, and then uh, we were preparing for, and then um, participating in the initial uh, invasion of Iraq in uh, March nineteenth, two thousand three. Was my first uh, real dip into action. So as, as you were going through that process, so there's the, you know, this, this happens in every sphere of life, right? There's the, the theory, the practice, and then the actual. And so, you know, you've, you know, as you got into the SEALs, you were obviously doing a combination of theory and practice um, to begin with, and then some more of the actual. And then obviously, as you, I'm assuming as you, you got into, you know, into the, the battle space, that obviously became real. What was the, as you got into on the ground fighting and leading troops. What was the biggest change in perspective that you had from the training time to the actual fighting time? Um, you know, the, the old cliche, you know, you never, uh, you, you don't rise to the occasion. You, uh, you, you default to your, uh, to your level of training. So it, uh, it, it, it's a really weird thing, but, uh, it, as things start getting, you know, more, more dangerous and more, more real and more close, like it's just like th- things get, they become really simple. Like you just, you start, you don't really start to worry about, you know, too many, you know, fancy tactics or maneuvers or whatever. It's just about, you know, getting, getting the job done and, and, and moving on to the next thing. So keeping it, keeping things simple, concise, then move, move fast with a purpose, violence of action and to achieve the objective. How did your training help you to manage the emotions of the battlefield? And I'm thinking everything from, from rage all the way to, to terror. Again, the more, um, the, the more training you have and the harder your training was it, it it keeps all that it makes all that stuff um i don't want to say easier it makes it simpler you can kind of compartmentalize you know those things because you're you know where you're going to go and or what you kind of do and or what you should do you, you have a, a frame of reference you know a lot of times the uh you know there's, there's the old saying you know like you know what do you do in a dangerous situation with you know, the people that always say like you know your fight or flight response right well there's also the freeze yeah. response which a lot of times is really people are just that they kind of brain lock because they have really their, their brain has no even frame of reference. Like what, what do I do in this situation? Cause they've never even thought about it. So yes. just, so just having, having gone through and drilled, like, you know, this, if this happens, then this, we're going to do this. If, if something happens here, we're going to do this. And, and everyone, you know, kind of works through those, those uh, contingencies. So if that happens like, okay, boom, we're going to shift and everyone's kind of on the same page and you just drill those simple things, you know, one at a time. And it, it makes it a lot easier to to get everyone moving in the right direction once uh, something that something happens that re- requires us to pivot or move or do whatever. Okay, so we're talking here two thousand four, two thousand five. Take take us back to your flow there. Where, where, from where where did you go from there? We got back from that first deployment in two thousand uh, yeah April two thousand three, and then uh, we just went back through another uh, workup and training cycle and d- deployed again um, with a different. Um, kind of mission and, and mindset and um, thing that we've been tasked to do. So we had to, again, um, we knew what we were tasked to do. So we had to then figure out how to acquire the best training and knowledge and, you know, expertise that we could to you know meet those uh, specific objectives that we had been tasked to do. Um, so it was a really great, uh, you know, lesson in leadership right then and there that I saw was like, this was, you know, people giving top down direction. 
on what to, on what needs to be done, and then they let the mid level you know people really come up with the best plan of action to to achieve those objectives. So it was a it was a real good uh, way to start very early in my career to see like you know not coming down from the top too much to dictate the tactics so much as you know the uh, this just give me this give me the plan and let me go which is i think a good crossover into the construction thing is like look t- tell the guys what to go or excuse me tell the people what to go build or what to do and and let, let them go do what they do best so then how did you how did you um progress in terms of leadership positions in your time in the seals so on my third uh my third uh, platoon workup and, de- and deployment. I, at that time I was the, <clears throat> the leading petty officer of, uh, of the platoon, which is the senior, uh, E six in the platoon, which so then all the, all the other folks, uh, below me. Um, so I, I, I was the head, uh, head cat herder for last, for lack of a better term. Yeah. And, then, uh, our platoon, uh, our platoon chief was the senior enlisted guy in the platoon. That was where I was really in an official like you know leadership position, right? So that was the first time, and it was great too because I had such uh, wonderful you know leadership by that that folks that had groomed me up to that point, and then in that specific platoon, I had such great uh, had two great guys with me that had been with me uh, the first the first two platoons, so they made my life really easy because we grew up together, we were taught kind of the same things. They knew how I worked, they knew I knew how they worked, I knew what they needed, they knew what we needed to do, and they were really great at making that stuff happen. So. When, when you great. became elite, when you took that leadership position, um, or you were, you were, you achieved that leadership position, what was the biggest mistake you made as a new leader? Oh my gosh. I don't know how long the podcast is. <laughs> <laughs> Give us the first one that pops into your mind. Maybe one that you're thinking, man, I, man, if I could do that one again, that would have been awesome. Asking more questions and, um, and, and really starting to dig into, um, more of the higher level stuff to be able to then, uh, you know, articulate more to, uh, to the, to the folks, uh, below, like, you know, the, give them the why and what we're doing, the objective and what more some of the strategic, uh, implications, impacts, the operations that we're doing would have on the battlefield and versus just, you know, having just getting them just, you know, ramp back up to go out and do one more op or, you know, and then get ready for the next op and, you know, really be able to, Give them more of that background and the why. So let me let me ask you about that. So so let's say you're you're super clear on the why, and and so then then you're on the ground in 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 the battle, and the bullets are flying and the decisions are being made. How do you think, in your experience, a clear understanding of the why helps someone when the bullets are flying? I think it really it's important to know really why you're there, because if, if there's a like a, a real strategic impact on what needs to be done, like why are we out on this target or why are we after this particular person or why are we doing what we're doing? So it's, so you, so you know why you're out there. So it's like, we, we can't just, you know, we can't just back up and retreat and go away and, you know, live to fight another day. Sometimes they, there's, sometimes you can, but a lot of times it's like, look, we got, we got to push forward because there's many other things that are contingent upon us accomplishing this mission. If we don't do this, then all these other subsequent things can't happen. And so would that be something you would remind um, one another of in the middle of the battle? Or would that be in, in a sort of a, a breathing space in, in the battle? You, would you ever verbally communicate that again? Or how, how, did, that, how did that happen? It, it, it kind of happened organically, um, especially mm-hmm. on, the, on that, uh, that deployment uh, in, in 2006, where what we would do is we, we worked very closely with, um, with a lot of the Army and, uh, and, and Marine that were deployed also there to, uh, to the city of Ramadi. And um, we would ensure like when they were running big, you know, um, big scale operations and we would be doing things that would you know, be there to support them, like, you know, really bringing the bringing our folks over as as we were going through rehearsals and mission planning with our with our um, American counterparts that we were working with and making sure they understood, like our guys were, you know, they knew what the plan was, what the objective was, what we need to accomplish. So then all the follow on things would come in and putting those people together. So, you know, you know who the tank driver is that's coming in behind you or the people that are coming behind you. Like, and they, you can put a face to the name and you know what you're doing, why you're doing it. We got to we got to secure this so they can come do their thing. OK, so you mentioned Ramadi there. Just to give the, the listeners some context, 
the, the the folks who are involved with you there are they are they because I know people have heard a lot about different seals who are involved in that. Are there any of those folks that that are publicly known that uh, uh, other people may know that you um, you can name so that people get a, an idea of the context of where you were at and what you were doing? Yes, uh, so I was I was deployed with uh, Lieutenant uh, retired Lieutenant Commander uh, Jocko Willink as the he was the troop commander for the troop I was in and uh, uh, Mr. Leif Baden was was the officer in charge of the platoon I was in. So all the, the Jocko Willink extreme ownership, uh, uh, all that stuff. I, I was right there for all that stuff as they were learning all their fantastic lessons that they brought back and shared with, uh, with, with the business community. And then, uh, a couple, another gentleman, uh, uh, Chris Kyle was, uh, sure. in my, was one of my guys. Uh, he's actually one of the fellows I referred to a little bit ago that we did. Uh, that was our third, uh, platoon workup and deployment together. That's tremendous. Um, so that that's helpful for the audience because it gives them some context in, in, into what you're thinking there and, and what you're describing. So so after Ramadi, where did you go from there? Because I mean, you, obviously, you know, it's like you, you you know from the construction point of view, it's like you know the 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 guy or the gal who's been a, an engineer or a superintendent or a foreman and they've just been on the ground learning the trade, really understanding what it actually means to get a project built. Where did your career in the SEALs go from there? From there, I moved over to our uh, training detachment. That um, they're the that, that's the group that puts all of the de- the SEALs platoons that are going to be deploying through their uh, their unit level uh, core competency training. So all and in that, I was the um, lead for our uh, assault cell, which uh, taught close quarters combat, breaching, and then uh, urban urban combat, urban movement, things like that. So coming right from that battlefield in 06 to that, uh, to that environment to teach what we learned during that time and, to, to, the, to, the, to the folks that were falling behind us. So did, did that then take you out of the, the, the combat space into the teaching space? Was that, was that a permanent shift for you? That, that was, that was a, that, that was a three-year tour. Uh, I did deploy, uh, with, uh, with the SEAL team during that time for about two months. Yep. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, that was, uh, a month, uh, a month of training and a month between uh, between training blocks, getting ready for the next the next group. But uh, teaching them again the and these were teaching the seals that were getting ready to deploy. Right, and is that typical for for a seal who has a, a extended career to to eventually transition out of the combat roles into the teaching roles? Yeah, especially for our instructor cadre teaching uh, not only the platoons that are going through, um, or, and then also some the the support personnel with their. Um, their requirements, their required training, uh, everything else. And then, um, or at the schoolhouse as a, as an instructor for the, for the students, I, which I did a tour there later on in my career. So, but that, that is typically a, um, what you do, you, you, you're operational for, for a while, you go teach for a while, you get back yep. operational, do it all yeah, over again. Okay. Okay. So, so, uh, continue to, to walk us through there. What, what was the, the next step for you? After that, I went, um, I was able to make a, another another 90 day deployment to uh, Afghanistan in 2010, which is a place I hadn't been yet, and I, I spent uh, 90 days there, which was fun. it was great to see uh, to you know to see the battle space in uh, from a different perspective, a different battle space with the same stuff going on. But uh, and that's where you really I started then to kind of see the um, the correlation of um, you know principles versus tactics, you know, and mm. how often times people get uh, hemmed up with the tactics and not with the um, you know, not on the principles, you know, um, I mean, maneuver warfare is pretty simple. You know, it's cover, move, flank, you know, that's right. It, it, it's pretty standard, but, um, you know, but you, you obviously you, you do those things differently on, uh, on flat terrain versus, you know, in the mountains you do, you, you adopt, you change the tactic, but the principles don't change. Uh, I would always have conversations were funny when people would be like, just people would arbitrarily just say like, you know, like, well, we worked in Iraq, we'll work in Afghanistan. Like, like, well, won't it? Or do we just need to modify the principle and just you know, change the tactic to, to, to still achieve the same, uh, the same goal? So just- That's interesting to me because that, that makes me think of construction. Peter, maybe you have a thought on this is um, one of the things that makes construction so unique is that every single project is in a different geography and the, the conditions on the ground, the conditions of the working population, et cetera, that it changes the um, the way that you might execute a project. So, uh, how do you see that idea of principle and tactics playing together in terms of the construction industry? I think just like Jeremy described in combat, Eric, there's and we talked about this a little bit last time I was on your show. There's just there's fundamental principles in construction that are that are timeless, 
that move from job to job and move from industry to industry. And, you know, one of the cool things that when extreme ownership came out, there was, there were some principles in there that directly apply to construction. And it, it was, yeah. there were so many people in our industry that just were attracted to that book because it was sort of speaking our language. So a principle like simplify, you know, yeah. keep things simple. It's it, you hear that from all of the good construction players, no bad teams, only, only bad leaders. We see that you see it at the crew level, you see it at a, at a project level, you see it at a company level. Um, prioritize and execute. That's one of the things you learn as a, as a young supervisor, or young engineer. Like you, there's only so much you can get done in a day. How much of it, what's important? What do you do first? What do you do second? How do you get through things? So there's, um, there's principles that you see as you go through your career that are just timeless. And it doesn't matter where you're building or what you're building. They don't change and there's something that's going to determine your success or failure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, Jeremy, as you're going through your career here, it, it sounds like, you know, at the beginning, you're, you're someone who's, quote unquote, in the field. And then as you're moving into the, the training position, you're you're becoming the sort of, you know, how in construction you have the dichotomy between the field and the office. And, you know, as you're growing in your your leadership roles as well, obviously, you have people reporting to you. What, what did you find was was changing for you as you became more senior in your leadership role and as you became um, less involved in the, you know, the execution of operations on the ground? Yeah, fo- focusing, I think, more on the, the, the strategy and, and, and backing out of the, of the tactics so much as I started to move up into the higher levels. Um, you know, and, and I've, I've seen it, um, and Peter you know, verified this as well. A lot of times these conversations happen um, in the in the construction space as well, you know, talking of you know, strategy against tactics. You know, like it seems like a lot of the times the conversation d- devolves because of tactics. Like you want to do something a certain way and I want to do something else differently. It's like, well, is it my position to even worry about the tactics that you're doing? Do you know the objective that you were tasked to accomplish? Then go forth and do it. Right. One of the best things I, I, I learned uh, – as I was a new instructor uh, teaching uh, the, the SEALs how to go through stuff. Cause I was, cause I was only taught one way or a, a few ways, a, cer- a, a few certain times, but um, you know, as we're moving through, you know, the, the training cycles and you start seeing things, people want to you know try new things like, Hey, maybe this is the way we taught it. Like, you know, maybe we try something else different, like really. And uh, someone told me, like, look, is it safe? And does it make sense? the tactic that they want, they might want to try or innovate or just like, you know, if it, if it makes sense and, and, and they can safely execute it, let them try it. Worst case that happens, it doesn't work here in training. We can maybe modify it a little bit and come up with something that does work. Or we're like, wow, it sounded great on paper and in practicality did not work out at all. But now we know you got to give people that's, the environment. That's really interesting there. Give those folks that environment and that space to really, to be innovative and be creative and come up with a different way to try out the problem. Just make sure you're, you know, applying, uh, you know, sound ORM <laughs> To, to and what do you what do you mean by ORM? Operational risk management. I mean, yep. Everyone, it's, it's, it's another one of those uh, fantastic uh, principles that bleeds over from uh, fr- from warfare training into construction safety. So, so for the audience, just ex- explain ORM in simple terms, just so that we we can kind of grasp that. Sure. Um, operational risk management. So, um, you know, this everything construction is a dangerous job. Training for yep. war is a dangerous job. War is a dangerous yep. job. Yep. Um, but we have to train to do it. And we're, we are going to, we put people in dangerous positions in training. We put people in dangerous positions on construction sites. So you, you do the best you can to, to, to mitigate the risks. You make sure that they're, the people have been properly trained. They have the right equipment to safely execute what needs to get done. And you train them as best you can and you, you send them out to, to do what they do. But you just really identifying the risks. What's uh, what, what are the big things? What's really going to, you know, cause someone to hear, how can we mitigate that? And you, fi- you find an acceptable level of risk. If we can buy down some of that risk and we're like, yep, that, that this is, this juice is now worth the squeeze. So let's, let's go for it. So, and sometimes that it's, it's too risky. You know, if, yeah. this, if the sea state's too high, we're not going to, we're not going to go, we're not going to do that jump tonight into the water because it's just, it, it's not worth it. And we'll, 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 re- we'll reschedule we'll, and we'll live to fight another day. So, so when, when you were coming up in the teams, that idea of, you know, presenting an idea and then the, the superior asking the questions, is it safe? Does it make sense? Was that something they did for you so that you learned that process? Or was that something you had to learn yourself when you came into a more senior position? That was, uh, again, I've had wonderful uh, leadership and mentorship for my, my entire career. And, and that's where I 
so the people they, they told like someone shared that that nugget of knowledge with me i don't know who who shared it with them but it, it maybe it, it may be as old as time who knows yeah but, uh, just let 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 the folks down there like the, the just because the folks you know wrote some some tactic or something in a in a manual somewhere doesn't mean it's the only way to do it take the principles yeah. that, that are learned and you know maybe we can apply it in a different way maybe we can modify it a little bit but encourage people to be creative peter how have you seen that practically in in your experience in in, in construction how have you seen that work work out or or even not work out yeah maybe not work out is is something to talk about first because i think we've all seen if you've ever been on a site or been involved in a company where the people sort of in the in in the headquarters or in the office or you know far from the field are trying to run the work uh, mm. micromanage it's a disaster they don't know what's going on. No one really likes working on for that kind of company or on that kind of project. And they, you know, frankly, no matter how smart they are or think they are, they don't have the information that they need to run the job. So the, the best run projects are the ones where you, you set up your crews for success and you get everything out of the way that you can. You put the right teams in place, you give them the right training, and then you turn them loose. Um, to do their thing. And obviously you support them and you monitor and you track it. But if someone's sitting in the office somewhere, you know, calling game day audibles, trying to do day to day direction, it's a, it's a recipe for failure. That's interesting. So, so Jeremy, as, as you were, as you were growing, you know, it's, it's interesting, you, you know, you, you, you're going from a guy who's got his hand in the dirt, so to speak, into a guy who's, who's not so much in the dirt, but is training the guys who are in the dirt. And then I have this sort of this picture in my mind of the the sort of the military bureaucracy that you begin to to interact with in a, in a in a greater way. Is 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 that a is that a true picture in my mind where I'm thinking, man, it's a challenging for someone like you who's who came to do elite stuff with elite people, and then all of a sudden you get into roles where you're coming up against. Well, this is the way we've already always done it, and. I don't even care if it's safe or makes sense. We ain't doing it that way. How, how did you handle that? Or did you ever experience anything like that? I think anyone who's ever worked in a big organization has experienced something. One of the things that like, I was fine is like, you know, the way we've always done it, that's a very dangerous, uh, it's a very dangerous statement. Yeah. Typically a lot of people like, if, if that's the way they're explaining why they're doing something, then, then they don't know it. Right. And maybe we should really stop and take a look at, at what we're doing and why. And maybe it does okay. make sense, but at least we're, you know, taking, taking that pause, making sure our risk management is, you know, up to date. We're like, you know, it's like, yeah, this, this still makes sense. Or maybe we really should look at it again. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, what, in, in your experience in the SEALs, and I think people can reflect on how this, this impacts their business as well. In your experience in the SEALs, what are, what were the areas where this is the way we've all, always done it? And because of who we are and what we stand for, we're not going to change this. In other words, these are our core principles or core values that aren't about the tactics and the way we execute a, a, a mission, but it's about who we are as people or or what our overall big picture mission is. What were those? What are those things in the SEAL teams that are unchanging? I think the only thing that you can really um, say that like the only thing that's unchanging is is there's the environment's always changing. Okay. So, you know, where we, where we've been deploying, you know, seals and, you know, just the U S military in general the last 20 years, like that's, that's gone way down now. Uh, withdraw from Afghanistan, withdraw from, from Iraq. Um, so now that we're kind of in a, um, a, a newer environment of like, you know, where it's really kind of unpredictable, we don't, there's, there's a lot of you know, potential out there for bad things to happen. And when you don't really know what, can happen. The best thing to do is kind of go back to those basics, like make sure that you have uh, control things that you can control. So that when something changes that we have to address, we don't have to spend time worrying about uh, worrying about the basics, you know, like just making sure that we have our, uh, just as again, like just folks, your weapons are sighted in, your equipment is ready to go. Your basic, you know, patrolling formations are down. Everyone knows the hand and arm service. Everyone knows how to program and use their radio. Everyone knows how to do, how to, how to, you know, use the, uh, the software to, you know, you know, do a terrain study, do the map, do the mapping, do whatever else. So, so everyone knows how to do those things. So now when something happens, we're like, Oh, now we have to do some mission planning mission analysis for this specific area right here. Okay. Well, people can go to that and start looking at that information, not have to like, okay, I'll come over let me show you guys how to use the software to do it. Well, let me, let me ask you, you an, a, a different, a different way. Um, 
I had the privilege of, re- of attending your retirement ceremony a few weeks ago in San Diego, and I was struck by the um, by the sort of the order of ceremonies. And there was at one point where where um, a a poem or it was almost a hymn was read out, and it was describing the um, it, it was it, it was the one about the American flag and the the different places that the American flag had been over you know a, a couple of hundred years. And so there was, there was, you, you could see how there was a, a certain thread that, that moved across time and across circumstance, um, that, that tied together the, the various, you know, tied, that tied together the history of the United States. And so in, in thinking about that, I was thinking, what are those, what are those timeless principles that, that influence the way that you, you, you acted and behaved in the Navy SEALs that didn't change regardless of the tactics or the strategy or the battle space. The old glory hymn to with which you're referring, uh, men- it lists out all these battles from over 200 years of, uh, of, of, of American history from Gettysburg all the way to, uh, to, to what's happening today. So yeah, you know, the principles of, you know, honor, courage, selfless sacrifice, fighting for your, for, for, the person beside you, those things shouldn't change. They never should. They should right. never change. And and really, you know, taking it back to the to the American flag, you know, that's that's this country. That's something bigger than yourself. Something bigger than the team that you're that, that you're assigned to. Something bigger than the the coast that you're on. Even bigger than your just being in the navy. Like you know, like a, I'm connected now with every veterans ever worn a uniform from you know air force marines every single one of them are, are, are those are all my uh my brothers and sisters out there and that's something bigger than all of us something that so then, it was here long before we got here and it'll be here longer after we leave so that's very interesting because peter let me ask you how do you think that kind of that mindset of 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 legacy or of significance can impact the running of a construction business You see that same kind of character and thought pattern in the great enduring companies. There's a higher level of purpose. There's a legacy. You know, even if it's a newer company, there's a there's an understanding of the history of the business and the things that don't change. And so we talked last time about great companies, and these great companies, if you look at it, they the people there, they the leaders know their history. Um, they have principles that haven't changed and there's a core to that business that has stayed the same. Right. And that core is the foundation that their success is built on. Yeah. So it seems like that the best companies are very good at identifying and articulating that and communicating it to the people who work for them and making sure that their, their businesses are run within those principles and yet within the principles themselves, allowing a lot of space for the, the innovation that we've been talking about and, and uh, that, that you found to be so effective during your career, Jeremy, in the SEALs. Yep. Give us, you know, so we're, what date are we at now with your career? We're, we're, at what point? We're around 2010, 2012? Yeah, I spent, uh, yeah, 2010, 2012, I spent uh, as a, um, instructor uh at, at the schoolhouse working with uh with, with the students and uh, you know two two years instructing and uh getting the getting the students ready to send them over to the teams after they graduated so you know, it, it was really uh interesting to be there around uh you know folks that are just just sponges constantly just just wanting all the information it was it was really cool to be there um let me ask can i ask you a quick question about that did you was, notice any difference in the quality or the temperament of the 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 new guys from your time from 1999 to let's say 2010 2012 that that kind of period was there any difference or was it, is it the selection process of the seals just do they they kind of get the same folks um, across time major differences no I think you still uh, I mean obviously there's been a lot more um, you know press and spotlight on the uh, on the- yeah. NSW community in the last uh, 20 or so years. So we have a, a, a much higher profile than we did when I came in, but, uh, yep. for, but for the most part, no, I mean, even the, 
the the folks that you know came in now you know 10 years ago while i was uh when i was an instructor i'm like oh my gosh that, i can't believe that was 10 years ago but uh <laughs> but even though they, they came in for for the same reasons i did even then they wanted to they're, they're, a lot of them they seem like they just kind of want to be part of an elite group of people that did doing elite things and yep with, with people that they knew had their back that is probably one of the 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 most comforting things about nsw was uh you, you knew that like everyone was you know, they wanted to be there they wanted to be the best they could be be the best version of themselves be the best operator whatever else and you, and you knew that they had your back no matter what so like i, I could just worry about uh, you know the stuff in front of me because someone that they, they've got me covered okay now peter let me ask you this in, in terms of a construction company then um from from what i'm hearing from jeremy is that if, if your culture is consistent then that'll help you to attract the right types of people and then repel the wrong types of people regardless of what the generational differences may or may not be what is your experience of that in terms of construction i think every company has a culture whether they're intentional about it or not yeah and that company's culture is reflected in its people and and you can see companies that have good culture based on how long their people are there, the talent that they attract, the talent that they continue to attract. And then you can see the reverse. You can see the companies that have high turnover, that struggle to keep people, that have problems. And it's because they're not intentional with their, with their culture. I mean, we thought over the last year, one of the things that we did was we, we thought really hard about what is, first of all, what, what is our culture? What is culture? And we just defined it as, well, culture is the way that we think and act. And so when we started putting together our core values, we started first with the culture and defined our culture. And that was one of the things that sort of connected at, at a root, like Jeremy and I in, in business was culturally and fundamentally, we were so aligned. How did you guys meet? We, so uh, Jeremy's wife is in the industry. She was a, mm -hmm. a longtime utility executive and entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And my uh, company, Live Oak, was uh, talking to her business about partnering on a proposal. Um, and we just really connected and said, you know, there's something, you know, more here than just this job. We should we should all meet. And we just uh, brought my family down to San Diego. We met Erica and Jeremy and their family and just started talking. And from that, we created our business. That's great. And and what what is your business focused on? So our business right now is focused on utility construction. Uh, we're in California. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the people in California, people even, even outside of California, see the, the challenges our state is having with things like wildfires, um, renewable energy, an outdated power grid. And um, we've created Radix to solve those challenges for our customers. And for, for you, Jeremy, as you were, I, I, I want to I, I, I make sure I don't for, forget the, the, the time that you spent at the, the headquarters. But as, as you were beginning to think about transitioning out of out of the Navy, why, why did you, you know, because you reached, you know, 23 years of, of service. Why did you decide? Why didn't you go for 30 in the Navy? Why did you decide now was the time to, to, to try something different? Because the, the decision at this point was um, it definitely had longer term effects. You know, uh, if I would have stayed in another year or two, like, you know, there at that point, I'd have been at you know, 25 years. Then, and like you said, like why not stay until 30? So if I really wanted to get out and try something new, uh, I'm 41 years old now and I retired, so I've still got I, I got time to get something done. So that there there was there was that. Um, it was it, it's a time of transition. Uh, also, I think with uh, just in the in the military in general, just uh, you know shifting out of uh, you know Afghanistan and Iraq into you know the into what the future holds. It was it, it just felt like the right time. You know, like just, right. you know, things are transitioning and it's just, it, it, it's a good time. Um, fam family wise, my oldest started high school this year um, uh -huh. as, as, a, as a military, uh, as a military person and as a father, like, it's like, I'm going to get all four years of my oldest high school career. Right on. I get to spend that time and there's, there's no way I get to make that up. So it's like, yeah, the true. opportunity that presented itself with, uh, with, 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 with Peter, where the, where everything was headed, and plus family, it just it just felt right. Plus, the last thing I'll say is like after that meeting with uh, with with Peter, like you know, like really, you know, being aligned with you know someone else, and as we were um, you know looking to build something, and it was th that was really appealing to me was building something, not mm. just becoming part of uh, 
you know, big established corporation or big entity or whatever else. And, you know, going in and, you know, fixing someone else's, you know, broken culture or their broken processes. Like let's, it's easier to build it right than it is to try and fix a, fix a bad one. So the, the challenge of it was very appealing to me. Then let's pivot back then. So, so 2018, um, you, you got into a, a different role. Can you describe that a little bit um, and what that was like? Yeah, that was uh, the last four years of my career I spent at uh, the, the, the headquarters of Naval Special Warfare. So I got to work for the, uh, the, the admirals in charge of everything. I got to sit at the, uh, you know, work, work on the staff of, uh, for the admiral to, as his uh, force training and readiness officer. So working to help develop and implement uh, training plans uh, force-wide from uh, the, working with our uh, recruitment and assessment commands, uh, who we want to bring into the community, all the way through um, certification and getting folks you know, final approvals and ready to go out the door and everything in between. So, uh, so let me let me just interrupt you. Were you in in meetings with the admiral and the, the top the top uh, dogs, so to speak? Occasionally, but most part, it's like my job is you know really to prepare, you know, help my boss get uh, he be the one in there briefing the admiral on a specific uh, you know training objectives, things like that. I was his, uh, action arm and, and, you know, working with my, with my counterparts at, uh, the subsequent, uh, commands to, you know, help implement and monitor and document and validate and inspect and all the training objectives were being completed and, and they were in accordance what, with the Admiral's desire. Was that a big step up for you in terms of, um, did you did you feel like when you when you get, came into that role? How did how did you feel? Were you like, yeah, I got this. I'm going to nail it. Or you know, because some people when they come into new roles, you know, they they got promoted because dude, they're ballers and ballers ball. So let's promote this guy and let him let him go, um, and and figure it out. And then you know, but you get in that role and you can feel a little insecure or a little unsure of yourself. What, what did it feel like when you when you went into that new role? That was definitely a big uh, a, a big transition going from uh, from where I was at a, at a at a team. Even though I was I was at the team working as a as a training officer at a at, at one team, so I had one team to focus on. Now going up to the headquarters where um, I would be engaging with all the, basically everybody across the coast was definitely um, it was a lot. But that's um, you know you, you you go in with um, with an attitude of you know uh, I'm going to do the best I can because this is what. Is, is supporting the the folks on the ground and you know like I reminded myself you know I'm sure many years ago someone was sitting in that exact same seat doing that job that allowed me to do the things that I was able to do so now it's my turn to you know do the best I can to set the conditions and you know help those help the folks that are going out the door now to be the best that they can be what did, what did you like most about your your um, your service as that force training officer at, at the headquarters sitting at that level and, and seeing um, you know, the, the decision-making process that goes into uh, things that affect folks, you know, f from, a, from, a, from, a, from that higher up, that 50,000 foot uh, perspective, you know, as you're, as, as things change, you know, like what was important, you see like what's, what, what's important to one department or one group or one team that's not as important to the other one. And like, where's the priority and like just seeing all the, um, all the various things, um, all the factors and facets that go into the decision-making process and, and, and just learning how, how those uh, things get done. It was, uh, it was, yep. it was incredible. Just learning how to sift through a, uh, a bureaucratic morass. I always, yep. uh, I coined, I like to call it administrative warfare. Administrative warfare. What's, so what's the difference between administrative warfare and actual warfare? <laughs> I mean, uh, and there's obvious ones, but in terms of, you know, in the, in terms of the way you, you approached it from a strategic and a tactical thinking perspective, what were the differences? Well, just um, you know, you just you, you need to invest the time to learn, uh, you know, learn the uh, the the culture, learn how things get done, learn the learn the processes, and learn the learn the procedures, learn the rules. Um, typically, uh, and you know, to any of your folks listening who may have a military background, uh, and with the um, especially coming from uh, from the naval special warfare side of the house, like you know, no one's ever you know in chest deep water in in, in January, you know, freezing dreaming about doing staff work. That is not right. what, uh, that, that is not what people join to do, but, um, it, it's all part of, um, it, it's all part of the bigger strategic planning picture. And, you know, you have to, if, if that's your job to do, even if you don't like the job so much, it's like, I need to do it the best I can so I can provide, you know, my, my boss, the information that he needs to inform the Admiral to make those decisions. So just in, in an effort, just trying to go back to do the best you can and be great at your job and, you know, and, just try to make it better than how you found it. So, so as 
let's just look back at your your whole career and and what I'd like you just to share with the audience is is your your biggest regret and your 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 greatest triumph from the years that you spent in the seals I would say probably the the looking back on now the biggest regret um, just from maybe being more more uh, more effective on it like you know learn really um, you know taking the time to learn and, and, and read and, you know, find out how things are supposed to be done before you just, you know, run off and try to make something happen the, the, through a backdoor channel or, uh, you know, or, or through, uh, you know, I, I know this person, I can call them and I can make this stuff happen. That's, you know, not sustainable. And it winds up making, usually makes the process and things take longer and cost more money. So if I would, if I had something to make me a better, more efficient operator, like, Investing the time to you know really do the, the the research on how to be more effective and more efficient and, and maneuvering through the military itself and something I I mean I it, as weird as it sounds I actually really began to enjoy that process the last uh, couple of years I was in there at the headquarters you know once you start to pull apart that uh, you can start pulling that thread a little bit of how to make things happen and then you you get some momentum going and you're like oh this is cool we're, we're learning how to be efficient. Um, let me just ask, um, uh, Peter, as, as you're thinking about what Jeremy was just saying and how that might translate into someone's career in a construction company or the construction industry, how might that, that idea of sort of learning the organization and how things work as opposed to sort of doing the bull in the china shop thing, how might that apply to someone who's in a construction company? I think that the bull in the china shop seems to happen all the time. I mean, it, I know right. I was that when I was younger, and you see um, – especially in a lot of high performers at the early in their careers, they think that they have to have that personality and mentality to be successful. And they're really focused on their own performance and just sort of getting the job done. And um, a lot of times it just works against them. And so it's so okay. helpful to be able to give people perspective of the bigger picture, um, the mission of the company, what we're trying to accomplish. And really it's, especially for newer people, that's, it's not their job to figure out. It's the company's job to teach them that. Excellent. And then pivoting back to you, Jeremy, what would you say is your, your biggest accomplishment or sense of pride that you have from, from your involvement in the teams? The promotions and the advancement and the growth of the people I worked with. I, it, it, there was, um, and, and, and not just from, uh, the, the, the seals that I got to put through training, um, and watch them, you know, get their tridents pinned on and everything. But it was, it was, it was all the, all the amazing people I had the opportunity and, uh, to, to work with and, and grow with, um, you know, just seeing the folks get promoted, seeing them get into a new, uh, a, new a new leadership position, just seeing people grow. That was really, that was really rewarding for me. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I want to ask you one thing and, and this is just based on a, a very short amount of time interacting with, with you and with other folks down at your retirement ceremony. And I was struck by, I'm, I was trying to describe it. I was struck by a, um, an almost, by the humility of the, of the operators or the former operators that I met. And what I mean by that is like, there's almost, I, I, I'm going to use this word here and I think it's, it's I, I, just help me with this. There's almost a sweetness about some of you guys. And it kind of struck me in a weird way um, because, you know, you don't expect that, you know, it's like, um, like I, I talked to Jocko after the ceremony. Right. And I, I, my, cause my boy was like, dude, you got to get, get a photo with Jocko, man. You got to get a photo. So I, you know, I, and I, I'm not the kind of guy who wants to go and talk to Jocko, you know what I'm saying? Although, you know, I like the stuff he does. And so I go up to him and I say, Hey, you know, my, my boy will kill me unless I get a photo with you. Right. And he says, Oh sure. Yeah. I'll give you a photo. And he's totally normal. He's not like, you know, some highfalutin dude. And he's like, well, what does your boy do? And, you know, he, I'm like, he asked me what my boy did, you know? But then when I was interacting with you and the other guys, again, the sense of sweetness and humility, which is weird to me. I mean, that's what it, it, it came at, not weird in a bad way, but just like, wow, that's interesting. Is, is that a true pers perspective that I had there? Do you, you see that with the guys that you know and, and that you, you worked with for so many years? The best ones, yes. Yeah, um, okay. Th th there is, there's... Um having a, you know, a, 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 a humble attitude and a, a growth mindset and just, just trying to be the best that we can. Um, but knowing that we're, that we can always be better is, a it's a great, uh, a great way to live life. As soon as you start thinking that you're the best at something and you, know, you, I can't learn anything from you, you, you can't teach me something, but you're, you, you're, you're probably not going to be a value added person to the organization anymore because you're not going to contribute anything and you're just gonna, just, just gonna, 
dig your heels in and, and, and fight any changes or anything new that's going to come along. So, and it's, um, you know, another, another great mentor I had, you know, um, told me something along the lines of like, you know, every group, no matter how elite has a bottom 10%. So, I mean, there's, I mean, as, as far as a, a, a SEAL platoon goes or a, a construction crew or whatever, there's always, you know, you, you do your best to bring the, to bring people in. Some people are just genetically engineered to hate everything and nothing's ever good enough. And hopefully yep. those folks, you know, they decide this isn't for them and they move on and maybe construction wasn't for them. Maybe being a SEAL wasn't for them or maybe it wasn't what they had in mind. It wasn't what they, uh, expected um you know being being in the seal teams like in, like you just alluded to is like you know your the reality was a lot different than what you uh thought it thought it was and yeah. i think it happens a lot of times with uh folks that come into uh naval special warfare or maybe even in construction they they, they thought it was one thing and they turned it turns out it was something completely different they become disenfranchised and they're like well i'm gonna leave or, or the, the worst part is like those folks aren't that they hang around with their bad attitude. Right. That's interesting. So Peter, just kicking it over to you with that thought, because I think it's, it's, it really is. I mean, obviously it's a reality. There's always the bottom 10% and they're always there. How does the, how does a construction executive manage that bottom 10% knowing that some of them, they're, they're going to have to be on the job site because we've signed a contract and we got to build the work. And yet I'm never going to settle. I always need to be working on the upgrading of my team. How does that dynamic work from your experience, Peter, in construction? It's always there. There's no really getting rid of it, but at the same time, you can't ignore it. And, you know, from our perspective, the most important reason not to ignore it is for the other 90%. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's, there's nothing worse than your good people knowing that you're willing to keep bad people around. Yeah. And, um, you know, for us, it's something that we're very mindful of and we're always, we're always making sure that we're not injuring our good people because of the bad ones. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. You know, I found this uh, this conversation very interesting. Um, Peter, just tell me a little bit as 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 you are as you are partnering up with Jeremy. What is your main motivation for partnering specifically with Jeremy? What are you hoping that he brings to the table from his experiences that will help the business to grow in the construction space? I mean. I we know you talk to anybody in construction, you say, what's it, what's construction all about? And it's all about people. Mm. And then what's, you know, what is it all about to be successful with people? It really comes down to sort of leadership and culture. And this is something that Jeremy has in spades. It's something that Naval Special Warfare has in spades. And so for, for us, taking those lessons and that talent um, and really applying it all the way down, all the way at a crew level within the organization is something that I think is, is very unique and we're so excited to do. Extreme Ownership is a great book and um, it really it really helps it really helped me as a young manager. Um, but I have to tell you there's so many principles that have come from Jeremy's experience that we just can't wait to share with everybody. It, and, and what the SEALs would call the action arm, we call our crews. And um, we are going to take that knowledge base and those principles and apply it across the whole organization. That's excellent. So how, how can people learn more about um, your company and, and what you guys do? Sure. So we, uh, our website's radixservices.com. Uh, we're also on LinkedIn. Uh, you're happy to, to check us out there um, and you can get in touch with us on both platforms. Excellent. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, I, I tell you, I found this interview very, very uh, informative, Jeremy. I really appreciate you taking the time to go into some details there and some, uh, you know, just uh, in your experiences. I, I'm looking forward to getting both of you guys back on the pod as the uh, the business continues to grow, to, to learn more about what you guys are doing to impact the construction industry. And uh, I just want to thank you, Jeremy and Peter, for coming back on the program here today. Our pleasure. Thanks for having us, Eric. I hope we can do it again soon. Awesome. Thank you for listening to today's episode with Jeremy and Peter. I hope you found it useful. Feel free to check out their website, radixservices.com. Connect with them on LinkedIn. This episode of the podcast was brought to you by Construction Genius, the book. Oh, yes. It's effective, hands-on, practical, simple, no BS, leadership, strategy, sales, and marketing advice for construction companies. To get a copy of the book and to learn more about it, go out to constructiongeniusbook.com. 
There you'll find a description of the book and a big fat buy now button. <laughs> so click on the button and for 20 bucks, you can get yourself a book that gives you insights that could make you or save you millions. And the reason why is because pro people problems are costing your construction company millions. And in the book, you will learn how to solve those problems. Thank you again for listening. Feel free to check out the book and buy one for you and your leadership team. If you are in the greater Sacramento area and you buy the book, shoot me an email and I will personally come by your office and sign the copies for you. If you're in the greater Bay Area, let me know. And the next time I'm down there visiting my clients, I will come by your office and I will sign them for you. And you never know if you're somewhere else in the country and I happen to be traveling and meeting my clients, let me know and I will come into your office and personally sign the books for you. Thanks again for listening today. And I look forward to catching you on the next Construction Genius podcast episode.